Hello and welcome to Freedom Watch. I'm Judge Andrew Napolitano here, defending freedom, defending your natural rights, and defending your right to have a government that stays within the confines of the Constitution. The government's checkbook is awash in a sea of red ink with national debt of almost $14 trillion. And yet we keep on borrowing and printing cash. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that the public's national debt will increase an additional $9 trillion by 2020. This means we are paying $500 million in interest every single day. A series of billboards has popped up around Times Square here in New York City as part of a campaign to remind people just how much money we owe. The movement is backed by a free marketer whose friends and enemies alike call him Dr. Evil because of his defense of citizens' right to smoke on their own property and in restaurants. He even took on Mothers Against Drunk Driving by starting his anti-prohibition group, Brad, Beverage Retailers Against Drunk Driving which argued for tolerance for social drinking. 60 Minutes nicknamed him the booze and food we industry's weapon of mass destruction. Joining me now is the leader of the Defeat the Debt campaign, Rick Berman. Rick, welcome to Freedom Watch. Thank you, Judge. Thanks for that introduction. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thanks for all that you do. T just give us a, an indication of how bad the debt is and how much worse it gets with every tick of the clock. Well, as you said, it's $500 million a day in interest alone. Uh, we're going to run another $1.5 trillion deficit this year alone. And, you know, one of the interesting things to do is to give people some understanding as to how much a trillion dollars really is, because for a lot of people, it's just a big number. And I try to put it in terms of time. If you tell people that a million seconds will elapse in 12 days, then ask them how long will it take a trillion seconds to elapse? And you get numbers that are relatively conservative and modest. But the answer is a trillion seconds. Remember, a million is 12 days. A trillion seconds is in excess of 31,000 years. Oh, boy. So when you, when these, you hear these, a trillion. These are astronomical numbers that Americans uh, and even anybody, unless they're a, a, a mathematician, are just unaccust unaccustomed to dealing with. The government's well, debt is so high that, correct me if I'm wrong, it now borrows money not to reduce the debt, but just to pay the interest that has already come due. So it just gets worse well, and worse. It borrows, almost literally yeah. borrows from Peter to pay Paul. We are, we are in a cycle of debt that, um, that we don't know how to get out of because we've never been here before. I heard Robert Rubin just a few days ago, who, as you remember, was Clinton's Treasury Secretary, saying that this is unsustainable. But people, um, people know that the answer is relatively simple. It's the same as with your own household budget. If you found yourself in such a horrible situation, the first thing you would do is say, well, number one, I'm going to stop borrowing more money. Right. And number two, I'm going, to cut, I'm going to cut my spending. So, so quite frankly, the answer is simple. Uh, it's just that it's not easy because now you've got politics involved. And if you're going to cut spending, then somebody's ox is going to get gored. Someone's going to lose something that they already have. And that makes politicians uncomfortable by because they have to take stuff away from people. Well, well, one of the reasons you are so popular with uh, people who believe in the Constitution and believe in the free market and so unpopular with people uh, in the government is because people in both parties reject what you have just said. I mean, Republicans were just as bad in the Bush years when it came to running up uh, the debt as the Democrats uh, are uh, in, the, in the Obama years. So the real question is not how do we stop spending, but how do we get people into the government? Who will stop spending? I mean, wouldn't this take a sea change in the thinking of American politics? Wouldn't this require 51 senators and uh, 218 members of the House of Representatives and a president of the United States who basically agree with Ron Paul when it comes to what the government should be spending its money on? Yeah, it's, gonna, it's going to take something dramatic like that. And unfortunately, I don't see it on the horizon. Uh, you know, one of the problems with this debt is that when you tell people how big it is, uh, their eyes glaze over. And sometimes people will say things like, uh, well, this is equivalent to $40,000 per family. But no one really believes that someone's going to show up at your door with, a, with an invoice for $40,000. And so right. you never really personalize this debt. And if you ask the average person if they care about this, they say it's terrible. But if you ask them, well, what does it mean to you personally? 
Most people can't translate this into personal consequences, especially into short-term personal consequences. But can people they understand the, the personal consequences of the, of the federal government through its, its banker, the Federal Reserve, merely printing money or creating money out of thin air in an effort to address the debt? Do people understand what that does to the value of their homes and the value of the dollars in their wallets? Well, you know, it's, fun, it's funny that you say this, and, and I want your listeners to know, I do this quite often, so, uh, so I didn't set you up for this. But if you can see this, this is a bill uh, from Zimbabwe. Uh, this, this bill went out of circulation last year. This is $100 trillion that was worth about two bucks uh, when the currency collapsed. Uh, they were just printing bills with more and more zeros on them because they, they obviously couldn't get out of the situation they were in. Um, we're not going to go to print money that large, but if we don't cut spending, the only way that we can cut off uh, our obligations is to inflate the money supply or have interest rates that are, that are astronomical. But, but, but uh, don't, and, don't uh, chair, Chairman of the Federal Reserve from Alan Greenspan to Ben Bernanke, and don't presidential advisors from Hank Paulson to Robert Rubin to Tim Geithner to Larry Summers, who was once the president of Harvard, don't they all tell the presidents that they advise that we can get away with this, that the Fed can just add zero? They wouldn't do anything as obscene as printing a $1 trillion note. They would just add zeros to a bank account of one of their, uh, one of their, their bank members and just create money out of thin air that way. Do they really think we can get out of the $14 trillion debt by continuing to do that and that there will be no adverse consequences? Well, see, I don't think you can do that today because today foreign governments are not going to loan us money if they think we're inflating the money supply. And as soon as we, as soon as we signal to China or Saudi Arabia or Japan or Russia, uh, these are countries that we've borrowed a lot of money from, as soon as they see that we're going to inflate the money supply or starting to do it, they want more money. Uh, to, they, they want more interest paid to them if they're going to loan us money. And then interest rates start to really spike. You know, t today people... Uh, you know, are worried about interest rates on home mortgages if, if you're in the position of thinking that the housing crisis is turning around. Uh, you know, we're worried that the interest rates may creep up to something above 5 percent. And people forget that in 1981, uh, early in 1981, mortgage interest rates were 18 percent. Um, interest rates can be devastating, and that ruins the economy, that ruins the ability of people uh, to have jobs because businesses can't expand because they can't borrow money at a reasonable rate of interest. This has personal consequences that are serious. You know, uh, you have to come and spend a little time here in New York City uh, because we have a mayor who not only doesn't want people to be able to smoke in restaurants, he wants to control how much salt and sugar are available for your use when you're in New York City restaurants. And he has the power to send his health inspectors to these restaurants to regulate the amount of salt and sugar. Is the nanny state going to crush us, or is there going to be some part of America where you can still be free? Well, you know, it's getting worse. Um, you know, I, um, I was an advocate of having a separate smoking section with good ventilation, non-smoking sections so that people could have their choice. I've always been a big favor, uh, always been uh, largely in favor of choice. And in fact, uh, I used to tell people that, you know, a good restaurant with good ventilation had cleaner air than if you just stood out on the street in New York and, and were walking to work. Um, the, the hysteria over, uh, over sugar, over salt, over, over tobacco, um, not that I'm suggesting that people should abuse any of these products any more than I think that people should drive too fast or that people should drink too much. Uh, but, but the hysteria over it always takes us into, um, into an area of overregulation, of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and it becomes politically incorrect to talk back to these people. And I think sooner or later the American public is going to get fed up with it, but it hasn't happened yet. Rick Berman, thanks very much for joining us on Freedom Watch.